Hello, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. For the second day this week, our study of the book of Ezra is being interrupted because I am occupied with a medical procedure, but I wanted to bring you a message. It was a tandem message by Apostle Don Madison and myself entitled, Remembering Jesus. It's a very powerful uh, revelation that was shared in our Thursday local meeting here in the Branson area, and I know it will be a benefit and a blessing to you. God bless you. Here is the message in its entirety. For, for some time now, about the word that says, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. And uh, there's a lot of word that, that's concerning this, and I'd like to turn to John 6. this and, and uh, where there were those that didn't understand what he was talking about were offended by what he's talking about about eating flesh and drinking blood especially the, the, the Jewish people you know <laughs> even in the blood of animals uh, they wouldn't touch they, they had to get all the blood out of the meat in order for them to eat it so blood was something was a no-no but when you talk about eating the flesh of a man and drinking of his blood you're talking about something else you're talking about what they would consider you know pretty far out and so uh, Jesus said a lot of things that blew people's mind but you had to hear him in a different way you had to hear, hear him in the spirit and that's why he did it that's why he spoke mystery and mystery so that those who would not understand does not understand it says, it's given unto you to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. And we have the kingdom of God. We have those that, that it's given to, to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. You see, and the world is not given those secrets. And people that are, are uh, letter-oriented are not given those secrets because they're hearing after the flesh and they're hearing after the natural mind and the procedures of the natural mind and the opinions of the natural mind. So you can't receive, if you're of that mind, you can't receive revelation from God. In fact, you'll begin to get, uh, you, you begin to move accusation against that person. They want to kill Jesus for some of the things that he said. Because the flesh hates the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He hates revelation because he can't understand it. Okay, so, anyway, uh, he begins to speak uh, in John 6. Uh, this is uh, shortly after the feeding of the 5,000 which is right near, was near Passover. So there, the, the, the thinking of the Passover where, you know, lambs were offered was in their mind. You see, and so he played on that. He moved off of the situation and began to speak about himself being the bread of heaven. They were thinking about what, what they were being fed with. <coughs> and how are you going to feed this multitude? You know, uh, Moses, uh, 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 he, he fed them manna from heaven. And Jesus said, no, 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 Moses didn't feed them anything. My father fed them the bread of heaven. But now the Son of Man's come to be the true bread of heaven. You see, and except you eat of me, you have no life in you. It's more than just hearing uh, words, it's eating the words. 
is bringing it into your system so that you become what you eat. You, we are the living words of God. And so you go back to where, who was Jesus in the beginning? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. All things were made by Him. In Him was life. God has given us life in Him. And so, uh, this is the, the backdrop of what he's talking about. See, Jesus wasn't some kind of a spirit in heaven. He was the word that God spoke. But he didn't speak through letters. He spoke through, he spoke through a person. He spoke through his son, with his, his offspring. His offspring was the living word that created all things. And, and uh, in order for him to uh, reconcile man unto himself and back to himself from the transgression of the first man, he had to become the second man from heaven. And he became that man. And he spoke words of truth. He said that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They're not just letters that are depending upon some man's intellect to understand. But it's the mysteries of God. It's telling you who God is. But so the word is 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 in his mouth. The word is in our, that's why as every man, if any man speak, let him speak as a mouthpiece of God. You're not here just to quote scriptures. You're here that the scripture with the Holy Ghost can come out of you as a person. You hear. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And there's so many people that uh, that hear letters and they, they have their doctrinal statements and they have all of this, all the accoutrements of religion. And yet they call it Christianity. Christianity. There was no such thing in the, in the early days. There wasn't any such thing as we call Christianity. It was, they call them, well, these are the people of the way. And people even made a cult out of that in the, in the, in the, in the past. <laughs> this is the way. See, so man grabs a hold of this stuff in order to uh, put himself into it and exalt his own flesh, his religious flesh, by using and coining phrase from the scriptures to make it some kind of uh, you know, to accommodate who he thinks he is. And then if I say, even if you say something in the spirit, the natural mind will receive it, and then he'll even begin to compare it with somebody else, and uh, then he'll, he'll bring accusation against if it's something that, that his mind does not understand. It goes on and on and on and on. That's why we have several perhaps a thousand different denominations out of the Baptist churches. I think there's 105 out of one group. And who knows how many is out of Pentecost. But what I'm saying is, is that we've, we've got to begin to learn to hear what God is saying and not put some kind of a ownership on that in the sense of, well, this is our particular stand, and anybody that don't understand this is not of us. And so, it, 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 you know, in order to have revival, you have to have something that can hold revival. And that's what I'm seeing. That's what, uh, that's what I believe this, uh, our little, uh, this little group, not, not that we're the only ones, Nobody's claiming, you know, that we have some kind of a, uh, just because God has given us understanding that, yes, this is what God wants for this area. There's a lot of witnesses uh, to that particular thing. But it's not going to come with just one person. It's not going to become with one group of people. It's going to, be, uh, it's going to come with people who have a heart for Jesus, have a heart for one another, and that lo the love of God is the essential thing. 
said, if you love, uh, uh, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. This is not kind of a love that says, I love New York, I love my dog, and I love Jesus. We've got to get a really handle on that word called love. Yes. Or what uh, King James says, charity. Or whatever you want to call it. It's the essential ingre uh, 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 ingredient of the Almighty. It's the essential ingredient of the Word. It's the essential ingredient of the, of the, the relationships that we have with one another. And that, and that kind of love is, first of all, it, it, it's, it's a, it's, there's, a, there's a humility in this love. Even though there's great authority within this love, there's humility as well. It's, it, it's easily uh, be, to be heard. You look in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, it'll, it'll put that out. Love is kind. Love is not easily provoked. Hello. Amen. We can get provoked over that. Oh, 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 oh. But that's not our place. We're not here to get provoked over something. We're here to become united with who God has said that we are. Yeah, and begin to uh, and unite ourselves with one another in the Lord. Now that's eating of his flesh. Yes. Eating of his flesh is not eating and uh, and and, uh, and uh, manifesting his death in the sense that his death, you see, occupied our sins and, and everything that was against us, and he took it to the grave. But what, what we're to be eating, and, and we have that understanding, so that's part of the appetite in the sense of the understanding of what it went through. In other words, the ingredients of dying unto ourselves. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I live in the flesh, in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So the, the, uh, 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 Paul said, I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me. I've been separated through crucifixion, which was the death of a criminal. I'm not here to make a name for myself, because I've already been leveled as a, as a, a criminal. Mm -hmm. But he took my crimes. Mm -hmm. And now we eat of the resurrected Christ. We eat of his revelation, which is the power of resurrection. Paul said, I pray that you will receive the spirit, the, the spirit of revelation and wisdom in the knowledge of him. And that you might know the exceeding greatness of the power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The knowing of that and knowledge in the Bible is becoming united with. It's not just some kind of an intellectual pursuit. It's the knowing. It's the becoming one with. That's what knowing the knowledge is. And so let me read a few uh, scriptures here where it talks about. Uh, let's go to, to 641. It says, Now the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know, how is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? See, they missed the point. They went back and, and they, they made him the son of Joseph, which was saying that, see, but they weren't married at the time. Hello. He's the illegitimate son of Mary. That's what he was saying. They were saying. Bringing accusation against him. They used part of his history to, to, to lower people's understanding of him. And if you if you go with the lowering of understanding of him, that's what that's what you get. You get that knowledge. But if you go with what he's saying, you'll get the, the properties of what he says. And that's the that is the life of Jesus Christ. He says, he says, Jesus therefore entered and said, do not murmur among yourselves. 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's only one reason why you're in this place tonight, and I'm here. It's because the, because the, the Father drew me to Jesus and drew you to Jesus. You wouldn't be here. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught, all taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. See, God has already, he's already, he already groomed us, whether we knew it or not, to come to his son. Because he knew us before the foundations of the world, before time began, he had us already singled out so that we would have a spirit to come to his son. You see. So we need we can thank him for that. Because he's the one that drew us. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of our particular snapping suspenders decision. It's his decision. No man can come to the Father except by me, Jesus said. So no man can come to Jesus except by the Father. So we have a dual movement upon our lives that brings us together. Hallelujah. To me, that's exciting. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is written in the prophet, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say unto you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Believe, become one with. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Hello. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore crawled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? <laughs> I mean, he was being really, and, and, and if, he, if he messed them up in the beginning, he's messing them up. On purpose. Jesus will mess religion up all the time. And he'll mess up our religious stuff. Yes. <laughs> then Jesus said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. See, and, and, and uh, the Passover was the time that they had the feast where, they, where the lamb came and they 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 let the blood out of the lamb and, and they went through all of this stuff and then they took the blood and the, the Day of Atonement was 10 days after the, the, uh, the Passover and that's when the high priest, the great high, the great high priest, or the high priest took the blood of the, that lamb that was to atone for the, for the sins of the whole nation and took it into the Holy of Holies and put it on the mercy seat. And Jesus uh, was getting his people ready for when he takes his own blood and takes it up and, and, and puts his blood on the mercy seat of heaven that represents us. We were there even before that because it said when we were dead in trespasses and sins God raised us up together with Christ and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places you see so so we're, we're dealing with the, the, the work of God and he says 
uh, whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For f my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, I live because of the Father, and he who feeds on me lives because of me. Now there you, there you see the operations of God. You see how the Jesus uh, lives by the Father and that we live by Him. And we've been brought into the fellowship of the what we call the Trinity, the fellowship of God. I in them, thou in me, that we may be, and we're one in them, and they're one in us. In other words, you cannot separate us from God's, from God. You see, is that something we need to, uh, you know, be? Uh, you can get in the flesh with some of this stuff if you want to, because the ego of man, because man is egocentric, can take any of these things and make himself to be something that he isn't within himself. There's a lot of people that's done that. I know leaders uh, uh, that uh, have done this. There's, uh, and you can go back in history, and, there, and there's many, even within the, in the 19th and the 20th century, there's guys that, well, he's God. And he'll go out and, 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 and declare to all the people, and, and they, they give him worship, and so forth and so on. So it's not for the, uh, the this knowledge is not for the uh, for that that the the egocentric man, but this is this knowledge that we have can only be received and understood with a humble and a contrite heart and a thankful heart Amen. and a trustworthy heart. It only only can be lived out of the Spirit of God. And the Bible said, if any man be, uh, uh, you know, chiefest among you, let him become the servant of all. If you think you're a big cheese, you've got to serve the rest of the group. <laughs> but those who, who are given honor, they serve the, the faith of the people. They don't go around, you know, tr trying to you know, exert their authority. I mean, they can and they will if they need to. I, re I can think back where Paul, this guy was interrupting his witness to the, uh, to another person, to a leader, the Simon the Sorcerer. And he, he, he said, Simon, May dry, what may blindness strike you for a season? He went away blind because he was interrupting what God was doing. You don't ever want to interrupt what God is doing. I'm talking about when God's when this, this. This is so important to God. You don't want to mess with it. Your flesh does not want to mess with it because you're you're treading on ground that. You, you may, you know, your life may be at stake. Mm -hmm. It's just like Ananias and Sapphira, lying to the Holy Ghost and bringing, you know, just part of what they, what they led people to believe that they were bringing. Mm -hmm. And they wound up being struck dead right in the middle of it. You say, oh, that's not love. Yes, that's love. Mm -hmm. That's God's kind of love. It's better to bring them home, move them out of the situation, than to let them there and ruin what God is doing. You don't want to get in the middle of what God is doing and bring reproach to it. Amen. Help us, God. So we don't want to do that. So we've got to walk humbly before God and before one another so that we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See. And so these are things that this is part of eating the flesh of the Son of God. But eating the flesh of the Son of God, the Bible speaks about, about our, our covenant operation that goes into the veil. 
his flesh. It speaks about the flesh, uh, the veil of God into the Holy of Holies being the flesh of the Son of God. And we eat of that veil to enter in to the present, the very presence of God. We take it in, we manifest it, whatever manifestation that the eating has in your life, then uh, when, when that happens, God gives us entrance into the Holy of Holies. And so these are, there's many different references concerning these things in the Word and the different things that, that, and how it relates to the, uh, the shadow uh, of these things which is shown through the operations of the temple. And I'm not going to go into that. But uh, as the living Father has sent me and live by the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate of manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Then he says, uh, what if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. And then it says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So sometimes there is the process of thinning out the situation and so it's you know that we begin to realize that uh, it's just not a, a matter of embracing some kind of a, a statement about it and and just but it's something about the way we live that we enter into this thing and we we learn what it means to be faithful we learn what it means to be a servant we learn what it means to take the very have the very nature of jesus toward one another and the bible says uh, you know like uh, it says a friend the greatest friendship uh, manifestation that you can have is to lay down your life for your brother are you willing to take a bullet for your brother <coughs> Or are you ready to? Uh, are you willing to live for him, for her, for their benefits? This is all part of this picture. This all manifests what we talk about when we talk about the life that's in Christ. And so, uh, you know, these are things that that uh, you know we think about communion. You know, eating crackers and drinking uh, ju uh, juice. Well, that's a, that's a, it is a, it's symbolic. Yes, there's power in it when it's in the Holy Ghost. But it's something that portrays something of a higher nature than eating crackers and drinking grapes. Mm -hmm. We've got to know what we're doing. In the remembrance of Him. What do you talk about? What does the word remembrance mean? It's putting all the members back. It's the remember. Huh. The remembering. It's just not intellectual in sense of, hey, I remember, that's in my memory. No, no, no. The memories of God is here. We're being remembered. Christ is being remembered when his body comes together. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Very good. And so we do this in the remembrance of him. And it was a point of very of, of life that Jesus was speaking. Take this, eat all of it. Do this in the remembrance of me. Putting me back together again in your midst. You see, so these are things that I believe that we can lay hold of and move in on a very practical way. And and learning how to love one another in Christ. Without any, some kind of, well, you know, you know, without grabbing accusation. Accusation is a terrible thing. Or, or holding grudges or all of this stuff. We've got to learn 
to be quick on the draw when it comes to forgiveness. Because God was quick on the draw when it comes to our forgiveness. Amen. We have to release people from the obligation that, that we feel they owe us. That's right. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, so, so we need to be, whether, whether it's received by the person or not, we need to be on the, ed, on the cutting edge of releasing them. Amen. This is all part of eating the flesh of the Son of God. This is all part of eating the flesh of the resurrected Christ. And not going back to the crucified Christ and taking some of our own flesh back and trying to manifest it. He's off the cross. Amen. Yes. Very good. I just love... Again, I just have to say it, I love that apostolic anointing. There is, when Don talks about the move of God's Spirit, he speaks from a position of authority. Uh, because uh, he's lived through the beginning, the middle, and the ending of a move of God that's probably, by some accounts, a greater move of the Spirit in the 1970s in the Jesus movement. <coughs> Uh, than we actually saw in the Great Awakening. By, by a lot of statistics, the Jesus movement of the 70s has produced more converts and produced more impact on Western society than even the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening defined for us what church is and in a large way defined for us uh, much of what we understand to be Western civilization. It's not just limited to a religious context or Christian culture. Uh, just as the Apostle Paul, without the Apostle Paul uh, doing what he did, and Augustine after him, the, West, the Western world would not exist. Uh, he was the, uh, not only the architect of Christianity as we know it, he uh, was very much a foundation, which that's what apostles do, they're a foundation for what we call secular, secular aspects of society. And it's, I, just, I just love to sit under that anointing and just listen to the Holy Ghost. And uh, the Lord's talked to me a lot about his mind. You know, God, when he's talking to us, it doesn't mean he's not thinking about something else. God never has anything in the back of his mind. We have something in the back of our mind because we're finite and we only have a certain amount of energy to think about something uh, uh, more than once. I, I've been wanting to get a, a cap or a shirt that says I'm not ignoring you on multitasking. <laughs> but, uh, that God, the mind of God, he, every thought that God has ever thought, every thought God will ever think, and every thought that he's thinking now, he is thinking right now, simultaneously, and everything that he thinks springs into manifestation as substance in the universe, whether it's spiritual substance, natural substance, whatever it is. And so when we talk to him, he says, let this mind be in you, hello. Because out of the heart are the issues of life. And they, the life and death are in the power of the tongue. Those that indulge it shall eat the fruit thereof. Because uh, when you, when you um, communicate with the mind of God or put on the mind of God, you're simply reaching into this crash, into a cache, into a database, if you will, uh, of a completely active memory of God or the active thoughts of God. He really doesn't have memory because it's all now to him. Mm -hmm. I asked him that one time. I know the Bible says we were with him before the foundation of the world, but I, how come I don't remember it? He says, because you were out of your mind. Because man did not become a soul until God breathed into his body. And so until your body and your soul, your spirit comes together, you don't have a mind because the mind is a part of your soul. And so we have to understand that there is, um, there is intellect in your spirit. The Bible talks about women should not uh, adorn, be concerned so much with outward adornment, but with the adornment of the hidden man of the heart. Mm -hmm. See, there is, there is a sentience in your spirit that if your mind was completely uh, incapable, rendered incapable of cogitation, the mind of the spirit would still be working on the inside of you. My friend Brent, we met him here uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I will never forget, uh, he and uh, his wife had died, his sister had died, and he went to see his mom, and she'd been uh, suffering with Alzheimer's and then not recognized him for years, not knowing who he was. 
and he went in and his mom was a prophetic believer a powerful woman of God and he went in and was talking to his mom and she doesn't even know he's in the room mom I really need you I need you to pray for me I need to hear from God and all of a sudden she became totally lucid and gave him a prophetic word mm -hmm. and then went back to the way she was wow. like my grandmother who had a brain aneurysm and uh, had they put her on a whatever device they used to measure brain waves, and she was brain dead. But she prophesied for three days. Every time the nurse would walk past her room, she'd call her out by name and begin to pray over her life. Every time the doctor was in the hospital room, she began to prophesy all the secrets of his heart, and he never told what she said. Because of the Spirit, there is the mind of the Spirit. And you can reach into that mind and get answers for your life if you dare. <laughs> Because one thing I've learned, I'm, I'm just quite honestly very conservative about certain asking God certain questions. The things that really bug me, uh, I prefer God to, to broach those to me on his timetable and not mine. Because if I ask, ask what you will. Mm. And so he will tell me things that I can't handle. Mm -hmm. God, doesn't that make you mad? No. You mean you don't care? No. <laughs> But I just love listening to Papa Don. Man, it's so valuable. Just a couple of things God gave me while Don was sharing. Apostles and prophets. He talked about how Simon the sorcerer was interrupting something God was doing with Paul. And uh, apostles and prophets who interrupt what God is doing are sorcerers and wizards. An apostle who gets in the flesh is a sorcerer. A prophet who gets in the flesh is a wizard. Remember the Bible talks about wizards that peep and mutter? People who follow them, remember the, the woman possessed the spirit of divination, the spirit of Pythos, mm -hmm. brought her masters much gain. That he got Paul had a dream. A man from Macedonia, come over here and help us. He shows up. That man is nowhere to be found. All he could find was an out-of-towner, a woman, single, who was also in business. That's the trifecta of having no reputation in, in the ancient first century society. But yet, what Paul did find is this woman with the spirit of divination moving in wizardry, controlled by a sorcerer, actually by a cadre of sorcerers, and, and she had the influence in the city. If you follow me, uh, I'm going to promote your ministry. These men are the great power of God. And he put up with it, trying to listen to God to find out what to do about it. Uh, but people who, why were the people, uh, why was she so effective? Because people were following her. Why were they following her? Because the Old Testament says when a prophet prophesies to a people according to the idols that are in their heart, I will destroy both them and that prophet who spoke unto them according to the idols that are in their heart. Mm -hmm. And people who resist, see, and these are the people who resist what God is doing. And why do they do it? They mock what God is doing. Why do they do it? They're afraid. They're afraid. All resentment, anger, that uh, ungodly judgment is rooted in fear. What is that? It's an unclean spirit. If the fear of the Lord is clean, every other fear is an unclean spirit. So we need to deal with fear. And when you see fear dominating somebody, exercise enough discernment to know how they need to get free. Uh, the natural outworking of removing fear is to lay down your life for the brethren. It's like an autonomic response. When there is no fear in your life, your autonomic response will be to lay down your life for your brother. Isn't that what they did in the early church? I mean, they were having basically daily 911s in the early church. Their society was falling apart from within and without. But what were they doing? They were so much in love with one another, they were selling their lands and bringing the money to the church. They were, they were laying the money at the apostles' feet. They, the, the apostles were taking the money and funding their missions efforts, but distributing it to the church, investing in relationships for real estate. Hello. And why did they do that? Because they didn't have any fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. And so it's not boldness like you think. You know, I've moved in some boldness, and I... I thought, wow, people that do that are really bold. Really, that's not, that's not it. My idea of human boldness, uh, that kind of boldness, is actually when I, when I got there, I found out that was presumption. True godly boldness, people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, they'll be bold and do things. 
It flows out of intimacy oh. with him. You get exposed to him, and he is love. That's who he is. That's what he is. It's not this teeth gritting love. It means I'm going to love Joe Brenneman if it just kills me, I'm going to love. No, that's not love. <laughs> love is effortless. But the only way you walk in that kind of love yeah. is to lose the fear. And as I was thinking about that, as Don was talking, my mind went, and, and what some of the things Jan said about, uh, I just began to think of the upper room, how they were waiting upon God, and how that it was pretty uh, unstructured, uh, they were waiting on God. The only thing they did, and they've been criticized for it, and I have to say I've criticized them, is they held an election to replace Judas. And I don't know that God wanted them to do that. And Matthias never really did anything uh, to, to distinguish himself. But the Lord told me tonight, he said, why do you think they elected Matthias? Remember how when Jesus said, one of you is a devil, and every, none of them pointed at Peter. And when, when three days earlier, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. But then three days later, Jesus says, uh, one of you that sits at the table will betray me. One of you is a devil. And every one of them said, is it on? Because <laughs> it took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That was the impact. And so these guys that had this love for each other, even as a diverse group, after they were in the upper room, they felt the void. They loved Judas. They felt his absence. They felt the void of that one that was not in their midst. And he was irrevocably taken from them. And so not knowing what else to do, they were vainly trying to fill the void of love that they felt for that man. Even though he had crucified. He had he's resulted in betraying and crucifying Jesus. Don said to those that are hearing in the spirit, it is given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God in Christ. So, so Jesus kept saying, be careful how you hear. You know, I, you ever hear somebody say, I hear a sound? You ever hear a sound? Mm -hmm. I've heard Kitty say that. She's the scratch and sniff prophet. She hears a sound and she's going to go find it. <laughs> and she finds it in some of the most religiously inappropriate places. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> Moses didn't feed them the manna. Don said, the Father fed them to manna in the wilderness. So the institution of Hebrew religion did not bring the manna. That made them mad when he said that. Because they were looking at their, their religious culture, their history, and their institutions as having brought the uh, preponderance, uh, the preponderance of their doctrine, their institutions, and their culture, having brought them uh, access uh, to the benefits of what was available in God. So in other words, they leveraged God by their culture. They leveraged, leveraged God by their DNA, by their instant. How many of us are that way? Uh, the manna is found in his person and in his presence. And I got, I'm always listening for a title to put on Don's teaching because this goes out to a lot of people on Sunday. And I, I heard the Lord say, it's about the bread of his presence. Yeah. And that's probably not original, but that's just something I, I heard. Yeah. And something else Don said, this little zinger he threw out there and didn't elaborate on. He said, God reconciled man back to himself from himself. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Jesus became flesh. Fully God, fully man. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, that's the only thing where if somebody crosses a line, you can't fellowship with them. If they mess with that, I believe it's 2 Timothy 1 Timothy 2 8, there's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And if somebody if somebody tinkers with that, you gotta draw a line. It doesn't matter that's the whole thing. Does it matter if a um, uh, guy said uh, God doesn't believe in the devil? Is he going to hell? He doesn't believe in the Trinity. If he doesn't believe in heaven or hell, if he doesn't believe in an afterlife, if he's annihilationist. I don't believe any of those things. I'm probably more orthodox than anybody here in this room. However, where do we draw the line? Who was the guy that put out the kingdom of the cults and he put out another book railing on the word faith people? People that were evangelical, people that were fundamental and full gospel in their preaching and he ripped them to shreds. 
and all of these people that had been railing on everybody else for not believing like they did suddenly got put through the meat grinder of somebody else's criticisms and it didn't feel too good. And the Word of Faith movement did a lot of repenting. They got a lot softer after that. And we began to understand wh where is the bloodline? See, the person that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, uh, that person that denies that is not of God. However, if by our religious culture, we functionally deny him because of the way we sequester ourselves from those who don't think like we do. Come on now. To the degree that we understand the words of Christ and understand that his words represent himself or his body of teaching, to the degree we understand he's not giving us doctrine, he's not giving us information, he's giving us himself, the bread of his presence, to the degree we understand that, we disbar the prosecutor of our soul and we become vindicated by the work of our advocate. In order to have revival, Don said, we must have something that can hold revival. And I heard that's really about the only thing we can do. It's like the guy prophesied to me, the wind of the Spirit's going to come, but you're not a fan. You know, boom. <laughs> that really helped me. Because I thought, as a baby pastor, I thought I had to make it happen. We cannot bring a revival. Amen. What we can do as a testimony, if we live and die outside of the experience of a move of God, what we can do is... Uh, commit ourselves to fostering in our uh, relatedness one to another something that could hold a revival whether it comes or not. Amen. To have something, to have a revival or a hope of revival, we must have something or be a part of something that could potentially hold that revival. I know what Dwayne's talking about, that past moves of God. Because I've lived in a pretty much a waste, howling spiritual wilderness most of my life. And I learned how to go back and taste of the vintages of, of moves of God from times past. My favorite vintage is the Cambridge Revival, when they got the jerks, the shakes, the running exercise, the barking exercise, the dancing exercise. Man, I've had a lot of fun with the Cambridge Revival, let me tell you. You know, the 1950s healing revivals. The, I've listened to 1,100 of William Branham's uh, meetings that are recorded and are available on the Internet. I've listened to some of them five years straight, 24 hours a day. William Branham raising the dead, casting out devils, opening blind eyes, prophesying to people. And I, I partook of that vintage because I wasn't willing to wait for something to come, come around. I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week. I couldn't go anywhere. And I couldn't wait for it to find me. So I decided I would find the cloud the size of a man's hand and I'd stay under it yeah. until something Amen. better came along. <laughs> the bread of heaven is not, the bread of heaven is a person and not an ideology, a theology which validates the thought that God, now think about it, the bread of heaven, the bread of his presence, does not come to us through ideology, or culture, or perceived um, standards of um, sacred morality, which validates the thought that God is not an evangelical. God is not a Republican. God is not an American or even a Westerner. Placing moral or spiritual value on such things results in us being excluded from what God is purposing to do in Christ in our day. Else we become just like those that were offended when he uh, called them out of the parameters. Well, he asked them to do something that was immoral and, uh, and socially repugnant. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Are you willing to come out? Are you willing to come all the way out if necessary? Like Hebrew says, let us come outside the camp unto him. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, Lord. He got to me one time. I was a good little pastor preparing my Wednesday night homily. And in comes God, burst in unannounced, quite rude, into my uh, <laughs> pastor's study. And I'm there studying. He says, you know what you are? Uh -oh. And I just sat back to the keyboard. I said, no, but I think you're going to tell me. 
He said, you're just like the priests. He took me to Acts where it said, many priests were obedient to the faith. Do you realize those people, for generations, the Levites, not only did they have a job and a place to live and food on their table as an entitlement of being a Levite, but they never had to think any child that comes out of my loins from now until the end of the world will never want for anything. And then along comes an executed felon, debunked and disparaged of illegitimate birth, followed by criminals and extremists. And somehow there was something about him they were willing to say, he is God. That's like saying Charles Manson is God in our day. That's like saying David Koresh is God on earth and he's not really dead and we're following him and we feel his presence in this room right now. And yet these people gave up. And the Lord said, are you willing to give up? And he asked me that. Are you willing to give up all of the accoutrements of this vocation? Which I was full-time in ministry, this vocation. Are you willing to give up all of the outward accoutrements, not only of your vocation, but even your faith, to the point that you won't even be recognizable as a Christian to other Christians? Are you willing to come all the way out, if necessary, to follow me? Yes, Lord. He said, we'll test that theory. <laughs> I like this one. Jesus delights not only to mess with, but to mess up our religion, our cultural expectations, and our politics. Mm -hmm. So God, help us to remember you. I like that. Let's remember you. Not according to political, spiritual, cultural affinity, but according to a people feeling after and stumbling after the bread of his presence, and we stumble into one another and find out if we move away from one another, we move away from the bread of his presence. So whether I like you or not, whether you think like I do, whether your culture is my culture, your morality, my morality, I am going to be installed in your life because when I'm around you, no matter how obnoxious you are, I feel the bread of his presence and I am famished and emaciated outside of that context. Yes, amen, Lord. Help us, God. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. You know, during the uh, Jesus movement, nobody considered it a movement. We were just doing it. We were just there doing what we're talking about. I mean, it wasn't a movement. We didn't put revival on it. Didn't even, you know, had no consciousness. But what we had consciousness of is that God was doing something very, very different. And reaching out to the uh, the lost, to the drug addict, the street people, the ex-convicts, the hippies that were going up and down from uh, 101 in California. I think one reason that it's that way is because in a move of God, you become so God conscious that you're not self conscious, so you don't realize it's a move of God till it wanes. Yeah. I was in one of those one time <laughs> yeah. where it was like, it was not until it, it was over that I realized I'd been in a very powerful move of God and I, I um, drove away from that. Uh, meeting and telling God next time let me go into it with my eyes open please <laughs> we probably if you know when revival comes and we're in what we call revival what is called what God called revival is here we won't even be aware of it as revival we'll be aware of it the power of it will be aware of what God is doing but it will not be something that it will be coined you know, because it, it's just it, it, it's just the nature of things. If you go back into the, what we call revival in the past, that's what they were doing. I mean, they didn't say, well, we're having revival now. Right. We'll be down but, here having Christmas cookies and drinking coffee, <laughs> and all of a sudden they come knock on their door because everybody in the bar just got slain in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we want. What should we do now? <laughs> we're glad you asked. Robert? When I think of revival, as I've read about 
some of the great revivalists, right? William Brandon, Charles Finney, John G. Lake. When I was reading their books a few years ago, and then I learned about the Isuzu revival and the Welsh revival, what sparked that? I've been wanting to ask somebody that question for years, so y'all get it. What sparked it? I'm asking y'all that question. Yeah, what sparked it? Was it because there was a lot of paganism going on, or people had turned away from God like they have today? So to me, I think we're, we're right for a revival because there's so much, there's so much evil in the world. There were there were moves of God under people like probably we could look at Maria Woodworth Eder, right. who had such tremendous signs and wonders, and out of her birthed the holiness movement. John Dowie, who was so radical. You know, and the Welsh revival probably was the first national revival that really got the attention of people in America. And uh, William Seymour cabled John Dowie, and John Dowie would cable him back a uh, telegram, you know, one sentence, you know, uh, pray till pray till the power comes. You know, Evan Roberts cabling from Wales. We we're, we're, we're praying. We're praying for joining with you in prayer. And they, they heard a sound. They heard something that was happening elsewhere. In the Welsh Revival, they, they were working, that, that culture, they were working 12 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, but it, so it, the revival was not birthed in church. It was birthed in home Bible studies as parents were giving their children uh, instruction. And after that revival broke, they asked... Uh, a London newspaper reporter asked Evan Roberts, can we have the same revival in London that you've had here in Wales? And he smiled. He says, can they sing in London? <laughs> so. in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? Papa Don, would you want to close the meeting in prayer? Sure. Let's stand together. I so appreciate uh, everybody's presence. You know, I just see, I see a, a, just an overwhelming uh, love and care for what you do, who you are, and what God God is doing here. Uh, I, I I I had a. a Terry, uh, Terry, your name came to me this afternoon, and, uh, and it was your last name, Stubblefield. Stubblefield, you know what stubble is? Stubble is after the after the harvest was what is left. If you go uh, past a cornfield that's been already mowed down, you'll see just little like stubble. Stubble fields, and uh, but but what they do with that is they plow it under, and it becomes a fertilizer for the next crop. Mm -hmm. And he let me know that those things that have been stubble in your life will be turned into a harvest in the days to come. To the degree of the, and you know, it talks about the, the different qualities of work. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. Where your gold, silver, and precious stones are, is coming up. And it's going to be uh, uh, riches beyond what you've ever experienced in your in your past. That's right. And and I, I know that God is 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 doing has done a great work of renewal in your life. And uh, and so your works before the judgment seat of Christ will be gold, silver and precious stone. That means divinity that means silver, that means uh, redemption, and that re it means the, the uh, personification of the lights and the colors of the rainbow, which means 
a, uh, a covenantal operation. That your life will be a covenantal operation. And you'll be, a, 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 if you receive it, if you can receive it, you'll be a progenitor or a, a mover within the next move of God. Hallelujah. I receive it. Amen. She believes it. I believe it. Let it be. Let Amen. it be. Glory to God. And uh, God, Thank you're going to see more activation in your life Lord. in this coming year than you've ever seen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Because yes, the, 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 Lord. the stubble is being plowed under it. <laughs> you have a field full of, yeah. of wheat. Amen. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your power, Lord, and work. We thank you for your great love to us. We thank you, Lord, that what we call revival, what is called revival, and the nature of what you're doing, Lord God, let it be that which is bringing us together in you, that uh, our hearts are being knit, knit together in love and that the world may know that we are your disciples, that we are your students in the kingdom, and Lord, that you're raising us up to be who we are to be in this area and around the world. This area, the state, the, the nation, and the world. There's pe people here, I know, that are destined to shake nations Amen. in the name of Jesus. And so we look to you, Lord, we thank you for your great love, and we yield to you, Lord. Let us be who you have chosen us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.